Well, it's 10 o'clock. I think we can go to get started. Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Today, we, we will be getting an update on the Refolio Roadmap. We will also be seeing a demonstration of some of the functionality that's been developed so far. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see all questions submitted and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Harry Kaplanian, Senior Director of Product Management and Software Services at EBSCO, and Jeremy Huff, Senior Software Applications Developer at Texas A&M University. So I'm gonna turn things over to Harry. Hello everyone, and welcome. And uh, to get started here, so to start off with, um, I'd really like to start off with, in many ways, really a thank you um, to the community that's been heavily involved with Folio. Um, Folio is an open source project, and one of the key pieces to a successful project, in fact, not one of the, probably the key piece to a successful open source project, are are really the community. Um, everyone that puts the time and effort into making sure this project is a success. And we have, of course, vendors that are involved in this project, individuals, but probably most importantly, uh, the librarians, um, the subject matter experts that spend really an enormous amount of time, both in the special interest groups and elsewhere within the project, in some cases as developers or product owners of the project. Um, because without this, uh, we just wouldn't be where we are. And as we think about and look about the long-term future and success of Folio, again, it's the community that's absolutely key and critical and going to continue to be so. So, of course, in addition to the community, um, you know, we believe there are an additional three sustainable advantages for Folio as well. One of them, the microservice architecture. Early on when we were investigating um, uh, really the architecture, the technology that needs to go into Folio to make it a success. As we looked around, um, what we saw with uh, the major um, highly scalable systems that exist out there as services on the internet, really they're all based on this concept of a microservice architecture where really the platform itself is built up of a series of services, small services that do one thing, one thing only and do it really, really well. And all of these services plug into a core and fundamental platform. Um, what's special about this, of course, is these services communicate over that platform. And what's even better is these services can be pulled out and pretty much replaced at will without forcing any sort of a major rewrite across the platform or across any of the other services as well. This contrasts really rather sharply with what we've been used to in the last 30 or 40 years in our industry, which are really monolithic traditional software applications um, that start off with best intentions initially. For the first few years, you see lots of innovation, lots of features being added, enhancements as well. But as time goes on, that really starts to slow down rather rapidly. Um, what we believe will happen with microservices and what we see in other industries is there's that initial rollout and of course there's that period of time where features and functionality are being added but instead of slowing down, in some cases, we actually see it speeding up. And that's what we'd like to see as part of Folio, and it's what we believe this platform brings as an advantage to the market. In addition, uh, the idea of an open innovation business model. Um, we believe libraries should not be locked into a single vendor. And because, Traditionally, of course, um, you buy an ILS system or license an ILS system from 
a traditional vendor. If you decide you're not happy with that vendor due to lack of support or what have you, you of course can switch to another vendor, but that forces you into a migration to an all new uh, software system as well, which is incredibly disruptive as I know all of you know. Um, what we are striving to see and what we're beginning to see is libraries actually having choice where they can choose to select different vendors, um, where they can choose to go with their consortia or their parent library, or maybe choose to host it all on their own. But either case, any changes in terms of who helps you support and maintain the system does not mean you have to change software. And of course, finally, uh, what we're calling a vibrant ecosystem. Um, we see this today on other platforms and for instance using the analogy of maybe your iPhone or your Android system there is a platform there and that platform is pretty much open to all developers there is really no one choosing what API's to make available because it's all available to you and then of course these systems were rolled out with basic functionality right you were able to make phone calls send out emails, text message, um, but it was really the rest of the world, the rest of the community, individuals, companies, software developers that jumped on board to that platform and started creating all kinds of features and functionality apps that really no one ever imagined and certainly not the creators of that platform, which really formed this marketplace that we see today. And this is something that we'd like to see in the library space as well. It's something we believe is missing. We've got no illusions, of course, it won't quite be on the scale of something like a mobile phone or a smartphone, but still there's no reason why we can't see that in libraries. And with libraries being such a key part of this as a project, Ideally, also starting to think about, as libraries think about their longer term planning, um, their strategic plans over three years, five years, maybe even 10 years, thinking about where they need to be, they can become the key contributors, contributors, actually the key drivers of innovation on the platform on the future as well. So our roadmap. Um, this is our highest level um, description of what's going on in the Folio project. Um, if you take a look on the left hand side here, um, we have a list of, I guess, what's labeled features. Um, in reality, these are really domains of expertise. They're somewhat analogous to uh, really what would be a module in a traditional ILS system. But due to the microservice architecture, the way we've been planning and driving change and innovation on this project, um, in many ways, we've been taking a look at these areas and really deconstructing what is a traditional ILS. And so these really are domains of expertise within the library where we know an enormous amount of work goes on by specialists um, that really know and understand what goes on in the library. And so, for instance, acquisitions, which many might consider a, a single app in a traditional system or a single module, uh, for us actually breaks down into a series of logical components or services. And so, for instance, they're the tools to manage vendors, the tools to manage purchase orders, and so on. And so, taking a look at this chart, um, as you can see, at the end of this year, we have what we're calling our alpha or our alpha release, which is something we're actively striving as a major milestone. Um, the reality, of course, is this project as an open source project um, is actually in many ways or has in many ways adopted um, agile practices in terms of trying to manage the project. It's not a full on agile scrum project, but we have adopted some of the ideas to help manage this project. And so we do operate on a two week sprint cycle. And so based on that, the reality of the situation is most likely alpha um, really gets released somewhere around the middle of January or maybe even closer to the end. But either case, this was the milestone we set a long time ago and what we're aiming for. The alpha release um, is an early release. There will definitely be features and functionality that we'll talk about in a minute or so, but no way will a library actually be able to run their library fully on a system at this stage. Um, taking a look at this, 
you know, other than user management, there's really nothing here that we can say is complete. Um, and that's okay. Our goal, of course, is to achieve our V1 beta, which is the middle of 2018. And once we hit beta, we expect to be what some might call code complete. Um, the key and critical features and functionality we need, we expect to be there. Um, but of course, there'll be issues. And ideally, we're using that time between V1 beta and what really amounts to V1 release at the end of the year um, to continue to get the important feedback from the librarians that are involved in the project actually trying to use the system. Uh, libraries will be loading data into the system and experimenting and configuring with the system, ideally thinking about what migration will look like at the end or possibly in 2019. And uh, so really in many ways that V1 beta to V1 release stage is really polishing, cleaning up, um, making sure the system is ready. In addition, because this is a, a somewhat agile process, and what I'll also show you in a minute is, we actually have a backlog as well of features and functionality. And so what we expect to happen as some of the core and critical features get built, the teams will start to pull from that prioritized backlog that we work with the special interest groups to make sure are prioritized and ready for when that time happens. To give you a little more detail, what we have there actually breaks down into this chart here, which is really a much more refined or more detailed set of milestones. And so for instance, if we take a look at this um, under user management, which is the very first row in this table, we can see there's the basics of user record management, being able to create, delete, update, modify, um, the basics of authentication into the system, being able to create and modify patron groups, permission sets, importing patrons, and actually SAML-based authentication and proxy features and functionality as well. Um, these are, of course, all laid out on the chart. Um, you can see here the next column, of course, the teams that are involved in that project in terms of getting it built. Um, one of the important pieces, of course, of this is this really starts to show in much more detail the work that's going on in parallel. And we'll also talk about that just a little bit more um, in a few minutes. But this is, at its core, a platform. And just above that, a platform that's designed to run all the operations that go on within the library. And I'm sure, as you know, with your existing systems, these are rather large systems. And so for us to achieve these timelines and milestones that we've set, does require an enormous amount of planning and many teams to join the project and work on this in parallel. Um, if you take a look at that column where the teams are listed, um, in some cases, there's a TBD. So for instance, for overrides and for printing, there's TBDs. Um, but if you take a little bit further out, um, taking a look at the chart itself, in this case, TBD is yellow. Um, yellow implying um, we're in process of getting teams to work on that part of the project. Um, TBD, that's fairly obvious. There's some others that are maybe a little more advanced. So for instance, if we take a look at acquisitions here, um, we can see, for instance, receiving and holdings, invoicing and payments. Um, we believe there's a group of developers um, that have been committed from Olay and Mellon funding as well. We expect those to start um, uh, at worst case, the uh, March, April timeframe, um, hopefully actually earlier, and it's starting to look like they will be able to start earlier. And if so, that's great. We'll be able to pull those milestones in. But um, you know, there's some cases here where the teams haven't quite started, but we believe we've identified who the teams are that are going to be doing the work. Um, another thing that's important about this document, of course, is, well, what will be available alpha? And of course, there's two ways to try and work that out. Um, we can see here, um, all the way on the left, we do have a column titled Alpha, which has a list of all the different check marks that represent what we believe will be available. Um, and of course, if you take a look at the right side, looking at um, the chart itself, the green bars, um, we can start to see where the, the diamonds or the milestones exist, where we think will essentially be done. 
Um, of course, there'll be refinement after that as we get feedback from folks that actually use the system. But then in other cases, we can see where we think will be done um, again, or in some cases, there may be partial functionality because we're not quite there yet. But again, this is all as planned and what we think is fine. Um, taking a look at this chart, of course, this was developed from something even more detailed. And give me a moment here so I can switch over to that view. And um, I believe you can see a spreadsheet. And uh, this spreadsheet um, is what we used early on in the project and continue to use today, where we went through with the special interest groups, with the subject matter experts, and work through to try and define what are all the important features and functionality that are needed to run the library. And so for instance, here's user management as an example. And we worked with the folks in the SIGs to determine what are the priorities of these features as well. And then once we had that, we sat down with the developers and the product owners to work through some of this as well, because for some of these, there's a bit of a natural order. Um, for instance, if we take a look at resource management, um, when we think about managing um, maybe contacts or certain administrative details, true, these are critically important and we know we have to have these done but we can't really work on these right now because we really need to get ourselves into a space where we can manage holdings, we can manage items, and be able to tie into a knowledge base so we can also manage the packages as well because resource management as it was defined for is to manage all the content, print and electronic. So when I mean there's sort of a natural order here, there's just some pieces that from an architectural perspective have to be done first. And then what we did was we sort of snapped a line, like for instance here on line eight or going back to user management um, over here at line 13. And everything else that was really had a requirement of the items above the line moved below the line. And that is our backlog. So when I referenced the roadmap uh, a little bit earlier, and uh, when I talked about the period between beta and what we believe is a live release at the end of 2018, these items below the line as teams free up are what we're going to be pulling from and that we expect to also release at the end of the year. Um, we don't exactly know how many or all of these yet. Of course, that depends on all the other work that's going on. But of course, as we get closer and closer to that deadline, we will see. Um, the other thing that went on here, of course, was we sat down with uh, the developers and got some early estimates in terms of what we believe it'll take in terms of hours or weeks to get this work done. Um, these are developer estimates that were created very early on in the project. These are naturally optimistic. So we took these, multiplied these by a factor of three, added padding for ramp up time and so on for new developers. And that's ultimately what got us back to this document, um, which again represents the breakdown. And then of course, thinking about this document, really the overall high level view over here as well. One other thing I'd like to talk about, I've mentioned multiple times the parallel, paralyzed, parallelized the work, the development work that happens here in parallel. And again, we can really see that here on this chart. Um, but taking a look at the history of this project, um, we knew that was critical to the success of Folio early on. And one of the key and critical pieces that could that the community really needed to bring to the project to make it a success. And if we take a look at this chart, looking at 2016, um, really for the first three quarters, for the most part, there's really one team um, that's really working on some of really the core features, which is the core platform itself that we call Okapi and Stripes, which is the user interface toolkit that all the developers use to have a consistent look and feel across the platform. We knew we had to have those pieces in place and it was really ideal for a single organization, single-minded focus to work on those and get those built. 
But of course, what, when it really starts to get interesting here is Q4 of 2016, and then moving into 2017, seeing how the number of development teams ramp up and what we expect to see in 2017, the end of this year, which is what we're in. And then what's even more interesting, of course, is we see other development teams on the horizon joining the project as well, starting in 2018. And again, um, this is really good to see what we believe are signs of a very healthy project. And we're only counting developers here. Um, of course, um, there have been contributions from the libraries involved in the project, the Olay libraries that are involved in the project, the Olay is an organization as well. We've also got um, uh, individual vendors as well that have been contributing to this project. And we're excluding product owners and UI designers, which have also been scaling up along with the development teams as well. At this point, um, I'd ask if you have any questions to please start posting those in the chat if you haven't already. Um, but at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jeremy Huff of Texas A&M, and he'll start. He'll provide a demo of some of the features and functionality that have been listed on the roadmap. And once he's done, um, at that point, we're going to open it up and try to answer as many questions as we can with the time we have. I'm expecting at least ten minutes, maybe a little bit more for questions. So. Thank you, everyone. And Jeremy, it's yours. Hey, folks, and uh, thank you, Harry. Um, I'm going to try to get my screen up. And I want to apologize uh, for not sharing my video. I'm not trying to be secretive. I'm having some technical <laughs> difficulties with it. But um, if you guys uh, want to just, I got this kind of jolly, bald, and bearded thing going on, so you can just use, use your imagination, I suppose. Uh, can you all see the folio sign-in screen? Is that what you're looking at? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, well, I, um, as y'all saw with that last uh, chart that Harry showed, the development has really been ramping up, and it's an exciting time for folio. And uh, I have to say that um, when reviewing for this and trying to figure out what specific features to demonstrate for everybody today, it was um, really difficult uh, to figure out what specifically to show just because there's been so, so much uh, development. And so um, I'm going to do my best to kind of give a highlight of some of the features that have been added and uh, specifically also some of the differences uh, in what's going on from maybe uh, uh, the last time these things have been demonstrated for, for all these folks. Um, for instance, I'll just to kind of kick that off, I'm going to click over here on this about, which gives you a breakdown. This is probably way more exciting for developers than anyone else, but a uh, breakdown of the modules that are running in the system. And as y'all can see, uh, last time I think there was on average probably about half as much going on here. So you can see just a, a lot more of copy modules and interfaces at work behind the scenes and um, some more stuff going on in the, in the UI modules. So, this is a cer certainly evidence of lot lots of progress here. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out is I believe the last time we took a look at this, um, the three apps that were present up here at the top were users, items, and a scan app, um, which has now been broken out into two separate uh, UI applications here for checkout and check-in respectively. And, uh, Jeremy, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. Is it possible to make your screen a little bit bigger? I got a comment that's a little hard to see. I'm going to try to make that happen. How's that? I think that, that's better. Thank you. All right. Um, one of the things I want to show here is uh, previously, uh, this is a, a little bit of an addition. Uh, if you were to scan in a barcode to find a patron, uh, I think that was the the main technique for identifying who you were going to, going to check uh, a book out to, but uh, this search widget has been added in order to um, utilize this functionality from the user management app in order to identify a, uh, a patron to check out a book to. So for instance, if uh, the patron uh, that you were checking a book out to didn't have the, uh, their library card with them or anything to scan, uh, something could still be done. So we could see uh, that at work 
another exciting aspect of this search widget is the fact that it is one of the first examples of a plugin that we have in our system. So I'm uh, now over here in the settings area. And for an organization, you can select the preferred plugin that, that you would want to use. And so we can see that uh, this find user functionality, wherever it appears, wherever it uh, ends up getting used in, uh, in the Folio UI, you can uh, actually change what shows up at that modal by selecting a new uh, plugin where you do develop a, a plugin, someone to develop a plugin that took a different approach to that fine user functionality, you could swap that out at this location here. So that's a, kind of a, a neat aspect of that. Currently, we, we just have the one, so I'm, I can't change it to anything. But um, I'd like to also, now that we're over here in settings, take a look at some localization uh, stuff right next door over here. Again, for organizations, some work has been done uh, to allow us to uh, select w your locale. And all the tooling has been put in place behind the scenes to be able to uh, tra uh, translate uh, messages throughout the interface and the display of dates and things of that nature based on the locale. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap this over to, to German. And we can see that uh, some of the content has changed in language. A lot of it has not, um, but that is uh, just because the translation aspect of this is a work in progress. Uh, but this does indicate uh, a lot of the foundational work that's necessary to do these kind of translations being done. Another difference that we can see over here in the user app, if I, if I select one of these users, uh, we can look at the date format over here um, with the uh, dot delimiters. Um, and if I were to change our location back and then head back on over to users, we can see that we get uh, a change date format there. So uh, that's some exciting stuff with localization. Um, over here in the user's uh, application, user management application, um, we can see that we have some patron group facets listed over here. And this uh, list is different than I believe the one that was demonstrated uh, last time. And it's not because it's a, just actually a, a coincidence of the settings of the system. So um, again, over here in settings, if I click on settings for users, we can see that we have patron groups over here. But if I were to add a new patron group, and then head back over to the users module, you can see that my test group is there. And uh, just as easily, it can be uh, removed. And then you can see that it is, is no longer part of the, that patron group uh, facet list. So uh, and just uh, by way of uh, showing the customizability of that specific feature set right there. Um, some changes in user management as well. Uh, we can see that the details page for a user has some additional uh, content on it. Uh, one area that I'd like to point out is the ability to add uh, addresses uh, to a user. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on this and we can see that the addresses have uh, this address uh, type dropdown where we can see that uh, you can add addresses based on uh, different requirements. And um, the specific list that you see here is also customizable. Uh, so if I go over here to settings and organizations, I believe maybe it is users. Yeah, address sets right here. Um, you can see that the specific uh, selections that we were, were available to us in address type and that drop down are the same that are listed here. So uh, for your organization, you can have any uh, set of address types that you want want to expose and, and uh, uh, preserve on your user. Um, moving down through user details, another aspect of this that is uh, different is uh, we have a little bit more detail on these uh, on this loans section. 
Uh, you can see it's reporting loans, but uh, at the same time, we also have this loans detail page where you can take a look at the specific closed loans. If the patron has any open loans, they can be viewed here. Uh, so, uh, some additional content uh, there. And we also have this proxy permission setting. The idea with the proxy permissions is that any given user in the system can uh, be nominated to be a proxy for another user for the purpose of uh, checking out materials. And so we can see here from, from this one user details uh, page, we have the ability to either promote a user as, uh, as a proxy for the selected user, um, or also to indicate that, um, that this user is sponsored by, by another user. And so for instance, uh, I can come over here and add a proxy. Um, and y'all can see that this uses that same user search widget um, that was demonstrated earlier. Um, and if I select that uh, user, he gets added. And I can then pop over to these proxies and see that our administrative user is Alyssa as a, as a sponsor there. And leave that does it for the things I was trying to highlight for the major differences in the user management and around some of the settings. Um, another thing I'd like to demonstrate for you folks is some work that's been done by our friends over at Frontside on eHoldings. Um, they have an instance of Folio uh, that is running this eHoldings uh, application. And I'd like to just demonstrate some of the progress they've made in, in uh, that area. This eHoldings uh, application gives us the ability to search either by vendors, packages, or titles. So I, I will just completely at random uh, do a search for EBSCO over here. So, and we get a couple- Jeremy, can yes, I get you to zoom in, please? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, and we can see uh, that we have some packages listed here for the uh, EBSCO vendor, some open access packages. And once uh, selected, we can see the specific titles. And I'm just going to click through just uh, to demonstrate the, the uh, kind of the multi uh, kind of almost graph like way that these uh, different entities are connected. So now viewing a certain title, um, we can see, you know, the detailed information on this, uh, you get to toggle um, whether or not this specific title is uh, selected uh, for your institution. Uh, and you also get to uh, see a specific list of the various packages in which that title might uh, reside. So these are um, yeah, just some aspects of the, the work that's been done on eHoldings uh, by front side. And let's see, I guess they um, be happy to drill into more detail on any of the stuff that I did show. Um, but that is the majority of the content that I had. It went a little bit quicker than I, I thought it would, Harry, but um, uh, do we have any questions? I do see a question from Pat. Uh, does localization include currency? And it is my understanding that that is in, uh, an intended for localization to, to do that is that Yes, um, currency and dates, um, as well as, of course, the strings that are being used um, throughout Folio as well. Yeah. Check in and check out. Yeah, I can, I can run through that. I, one of the reasons why I didn't uh, do this uh, um, initially was just because it had been demo, demoed previously. But yeah, I will happily kind of go through that process. So. Um, We'll come over here to check out and we will select a patron and uh, I need to specifically be sure that I select a patron that has a, uh, a barcode since that's uh, what we're using to identify our, our patrons. Once uh, selected, 
I can then enter a barcode for a specific item. And I can uh, check that item out to the patron. Um, I could, at this point, add multiple items and then check them all out in one go to this patron. But we will just do this on one item right over here. And then I'm going to head over to the user application. We'll do a, a user management. We'll do a search for Quinn and take a look at their loans. And we can see now that the, this uh, patron has one open loan. And if I hop over to the loans detail, we can see that it is, in fact, this uh, book that we checked out to them. I'm going to uh, copy this barcode for this item. And then we can come over here to check in. I can use that to check the book back into our system. Let's pop back over and check Quinn out. And we can see that they have now one closed loan. Open loans list nothing. Closed loan does have our uh, selected item that we check back in. And I think that uh, kind of wraps it up for that, that cycle and, and how the general process uh, would work. Okay. So we and, have, we've gotten a few questions through chat. Do you want to start tackling some of those? Um, yeah. Sure. So um, the question about uh, being able to search other databases besides EBSCO, absolutely. Um, that knowledge base that's being searched, you can search for ProQuest, for example, um, and you can do that now and they appear. Um, whoops. And so search for a vendor. Oh, that's NASA. That works too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see, we got our vendors. Um, let's see. Having a little bit of trouble getting back to the search page. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. And your search for ProQuest. Okay. And click on it. And there we see a list of all their packages. And you can click on those and see the individual titles as well. And then we got a question asking, uh, when you were going through the users, uh, the user app, somebody asked whether somebody could be added to more than one group. Right now, um, if I remember correctly, it is one group per patron, and we believe the way groups have been implemented, um, it will support every use case. That said, once the alpha is out and librarians actually start using this, um, we may find we may need to make some changes, but so far, so good. Will the system be recording historic loans? It will. Um, there will also be an option for when the item is returned to sever the connection from the person that um, borrowed it for areas of the world that need that privacy. Um, there's also another question about how long closed loans are maintained within the system. Uh, <laughs> I, please keep in mind that this is a project under development. So right now, indefinitely, um, there will need to be a feature where um, added um, a little later to the system where that can be controlled. So, does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to ask Jeremy or Harry? Um, let me see here. There was a, a, a question earlier on codex, and can codex be modified without rewriting code? Um, it, it can be. 
Um, but there was also a question about namespaces or adding additional namespaces. Um, I'm honestly, truthfully, not the sure, not sure of the answer there, but I'm, I'm going to guess it's no, but that depends on how we discuss this and how we talk about this. Um, Codex represents really an abstraction layer of the different metadata formats that can be used within the system. And one of the goals for Folio is to support multiple knowledge bases simultaneously, but also support multiple metadata formats simultaneously as well. And that codex gives us that abstraction layer. So when we build applications, um, the applications can work with the codex as needed, but we can add additional formats to the system later without rewriting those applications. Um, and so we like to see really Folio with Codex being a platform that can help libraries get to where they want to be in the future in terms of adopting new and additional metadata formats, or maybe even as a platform that they can experiment with. So in a way, namespaces, I guess, can be added through additional formats, and there can even be editors and tools for those additional formats. But... Um, uh, the codex itself represents a standard way for all the standard applications and core applications in Folio to operate, but without breaking them. So have the um, check-in and check-out modules been tested with a relatively large amount of data? So we've just started testing at bulk. Um, we've been able to load um, 6 million records into the system um, that represent really items and uh, holdings within the system. And um, it, to be truthful, um, we're working on the improvements. Um, we're trying to get this done as early as possible. Um, as you can tell, we're basically looking at roughly a year out already and we're starting to do testing at scale. And so um, uh, from now until probably the day the first library attempts to use it, there will continue to be optimiz optimizations coming into place. Um, we know at a bare minimum, we need to be able to support at least 10 million items, at least for a start. Those are our initial goals. Um, but we're looking to get to several hundred million. Um, but it'll, it's, it'll take a little bit of work to get there. <clears throat> I'm going to address John Miller's question of what kind of backend does circulation use. And uh, we can see in the about section uh, and uh, the user interface that there are two modules here concerned with circulation. Um, each of these are uh, copy modules and they uh, happen to be implemented in uh, Java using the vertex li library. So. We received a question asking if loans would include current and past ebooks and journal articles uh, for e resources. And so I'm taking that as usage statistics. Yeah, I believe that currently the all, um, yeah, loans refers uh, specifically to, uh, uh, to things that have gone through the circulation process. Or uh, physical items. Um. Uh, there has been, there have been multiple discussions about uh, what circulation might look or act like for electronic or non-physical items as well. That's not something I think where we've reached a conclusion um, as to what um, we're going to do or how that's going to be handled or if it can be and what information we can actually get for vendor, from vendors to track those type of transactions live. Um, there's some very definite work that would have to happen there in the future. That said, for usage statistics, um, the plan or for the core of what really is major reporting is really a, a data warehousing application um, that will be part of Folio as well, where all transactions, all data sets, all logs that are being created end up in the data warehouse where really any sort of analytics or reporting can actually be generated. But what that also implies is any external data like counter data, usage data, for example, and so on can also be harvested and made part of that. So all that data exists in one place for reporting purposes and analytics purposes for the libraries. Uh, 
Um, I see a question from John Miller. How do you anticipate handling reporting that needs to query data from multiple modules? Um, a report that needs cataloging data and acquisitions data. So um, if I remember, Harry, from your uh, chart, uh, the reporting module has not, uh, is about to be worked on, but it has not been begun yet. Is that right? That is correct. And really reporting um, for Folio breaks down across multiple areas. There's in-app reporting, of course, that every app is free um, to implement. Um, but then there's sort of that data warehousing concept that I just mentioned uh, a few minutes about, ago, which is where really the aggregation of all the data within the system is expected. And I, I've not been privy to any of the technical discussions. I'm planning out exactly how that will be implemented. But um, just off the top of my head, um, I know that there are facilities in place when you are uh, describing one of your modules to request from Okapi uh, uh, information about uh, things that are happening in the pipeline. So for instance, you can filter off content that's being uh, requested from other modules and as, uh, for instance, how our authorization works. Um, and so I imagine the reporting model uh, module will be uh, leaning on some of that functionality in order to gather statistics on yes. what's happening across the system. Yes. Well, I got clarification on the question earlier about uh, loans and, and ebooks and, and e-resources. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they've asked whether a person would be able to see ebooks that they've looked at in the past in, in their record or e journal articles. So right now, no, um, that's something we have to plan for and add on a little later. Um, circulation right now for better or for worse is a little bit um, physical material oriented at the moment, um, but that's something we plan on changing. And then the question we got is, are there other source code repos that we should watch to see other aspects of ongoing development? Uh, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but all the code um, is checked in to GitHub. Um, however, because we do have multiple teams working on the project, um, as different teams submit code, um, code is reviewed by the core developers. And there's particular criteria we're looking for for the code and documentation to meet uh, before it gets checked in and becomes part of the main branch of the project. Yeah, that, that is uh, my understanding as well. And yeah, this uh, on GitHub at folio-org, uh, uh, a vast majority of what's going on with Folio um, is going to be here specific um, developers might fork a repository into their own space in order to get some work done, but ultimately it ends up uh, back, uh, back here. Um, I can address this um, uh, question expressed by Chris. Let's see, it says, what kind of database is the storage at back end? And I, add on how is the uh, database structured. Um, the, the modular architecture and microservice architecture that uh, uh, is being implemented here uh, for a copy uh, makes this uh, uh, a very cool question to answer. Uh, basically the question of storage is a, a question that gets solved by each individual module. And so uh, for each module, uh, you can come up with a, uh, a solution for storage, a database solution uh, that is uh, the best for that module's task. And that's, uh, that's a neat aspect of it, but it does also make it so that describing some unified schema that expresses all the things that Okapi is doing is not a possible thing. Um, and it really encourages uh, the use of the Okapi API for interacting with the system rather than uh, uh, going to individual uh, modules, databases, in order to get a look at what's going on. And so, for example, I mentioned acquisitions has really, in a way, decomposed. So the vendor management piece that's been built is really a self-contained 
app. Um, it works with its own microservice, and within that microservice, it fully takes care of storage and um, the data store for that vendor information. So I think you answered the question, does each module have its own data store? Or do they share a common data store? But so how do, you, how do you handle data integrity within a module and between modules? Uh, there's um, uh, currently uh, the modules that uh, concern themselves with data across modules uh, have a business logic module that is uh, responsible for um, through business logic uh, ensuring that there is concurrency uh, between the different data points and making sure that things that are, uh, I guess, almost like synthetically joined are, um, are handled in that business logic layer. Are there any other questions? I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. All right. So let me get this up. So this concludes today's Folio Forum. You can continue the conversation at Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the Open Library Environment.org website. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a feature forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facil facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum will be on November 15th and will focus on the folio development process. You can go to the same website for more details and the link to register. Thank you to our speakers, Harry Kaplanian and Jeremy Huff, and to everyone who has asked questions and added comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.